Hello and welcome back to Char Reads. This is a belated video. I got really sick at the start of December, not coronavirus. Um, and then it was Christmas, I ran away to the seaside, etc, etc. I'm back in London now. Um, so time to share some books that I read in November and December. First thing first, what you're all really here for, pup date. Um, I have a little dog on my lap. Huxley is now five months old. He's as cute as ever. He still likes biting things a lot. Um, I seem to have found him in a very calm mood, so this is nice and rare. <laughs> the first book I have to talk about is Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. This came out in 2005, but you may know it from the 2010 film adaption. Um, it follows mostly a girl called Kathy and her friends Ruth and Tommy as they go to this elite boarding school called Hailsham. Um, but something's like a bit off the whole book and you find out towards the end what is different between these people um, and the rest of society. This is one of those books where there is a big twist kind of plot point uh, where I, I knew about it before I came into it. I think maybe it would be a lot nicer to read if you didn't know about it at all but um, it's also very hard to talk about the book <laughs> without it. So this is, I'm going to talk about it very very spoilery. Please skip to the next book I'm going to talk about. Um, time starts below uh, if you don't want to hear me talk about this. So the thing is these are organ donors, vital organ donors, so they are raised specifically so their organs can be harvested and they're raised in a particularly nice environment where the point of the school is to show that these children actually do have souls and can produce art and can contribute to society in other ways rather than just being organ donors. So they have a pretty cushy life in the UK compared to a lot of other donors. So this takes place in the late 1990s and that's like the only significant difference. There's no like weird future technology there. It's just that at a certain point of time they started using people just for organ donation. So you go through school at 18, you become a carer um, for people that are donating. So you can be a carer for, I think, between two and 10 years, um, and then you're called up to, to donate. But as a carer, um, you're like visiting the people that have donated and caring about their welfare and all that. And it's sort of seen as like an actual job, <laughs> even though it's very disturbing. So when you hear about this plot, you think, oh wow, this is gonna be like that film, The Island. It's gonna be really horrific and dramatic. But Kazuo Ishiguro takes this construct and actually puts it in a very, very quiet novel. I tend to really like quiet novels. Um, I think it gives you more time to kind of sit with things uh, and for them to work their way into your brain than it just being like action, action, action. Um, but the trouble with this, I think if you're not like entirely gripped by it, as I wasn't because I already knew what was up. It doesn't force the horror on you. You have to you have to choose to sit with it to feel the, the horror and the pain and the tragedy of the story. Um, because without doing that, it's quite easy to get through to the end of it and just be like, well, that was a bit dull. Like they took a really cool concept um, and then just like set it in very quotidian English countryside. <laughs> and these like kids having fights with each other. I think I sit between those two sort of readings of it. Um, because at points I did sit back and think about how horrific it was um, and at other points I was just like it's a bit dull. So that's Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. So the next book I'm going to talk about is Gia Tolentino's Trick Mirror. Um, I mentioned this in two previous videos. Um, I last spoke to you and I was about halfway through it and I got to the end of it in November and I put it down and I was like that was great. I really loved it. Um, I've seen a lot of complaints about it being a bit too self-referential, a bit boring, a bit like um, these are topics that have been like trod too many times. Uh, but personally, it just really, really resonated with me. I think there were two main themes um, in these essays. One is modern femininity. How can you be an empowered feminist and still keep a house in order, be really domestic, do everything that um, society has been telling you to do for centuries, live up to that, but then also try and denounce it. She touches on topics like marriage and self-optimization in a way that I've had a lot of those thoughts and feelings before, but she just synthesizes them and very kind of critically and often academically into a really good summary of all of the, the issues that young women face. The other main topic she touches on is internet culture. So like the rise of the internet and social media and how that changes how we act and how we perceive others. Um, there's also a really great essay about scams in this age. Um, so this is the kind of collection that probably won't last too long. I'm not sure it's going to be relevant. It's so, it's so anchored in the present maybe plus or minus five years. 
Um, but for this time and for someone, like, as I've said before, like a young millennial tech savvy cosmopolitan person like me, it really just hits all of the spots and I loved it. Tea break. Moving on in a very different direction. Uh, we have, we wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families by Philip Gorovich. Um, this came out in 1998 and it's about the 1994 Rwandan genocide um, where the Hutus killed the Tutsi minority, um, like a million people-ish, a bit less than a million people died within a hundred days. One ethnic group absolutely exterminated another ethnic group um, with very little intervention from other powers. This is a very interesting read, it was for a book club um, and it was just something I didn't know anything about really. I sort of like heard of the Rwandan genocide, knew it was vaguely recent uh, but didn't know any of the ins and outs of it um, and this gives a very thorough grounding of the context that led up um, to, to the events of 1994. Absolutely astonishing the speed at which like people turned on their neighbours. This book has a lot of interviews um, with, with survivors of the massacre um talking saying really really horrific things about how their their neighbors had turned on one another um and it delves a lot into the kind of personal culpability and complicity people didn't stand up to this or sometimes actively went along with with killing their fellow man sometimes out of fear of retribution sometimes out of um, like really thinking that it was the right thing to do to exterminate that populace. The other thing that's touched on heavily in this book is the foreign response that was absolutely damningly shite. <laughs> like the, the UN saw this coming and, and actively ignored it. Um, there were people on the ground that were like, send me this many troops and we will quell this whole situation. And the UN were just like, but there's nothing, nothing's happened yet. You don't have to do anything if nothing's happened. And even when something happens, then we have to get everyone out because there was a situation where UN workers were killed in Somalia, I wanna say, maybe a couple years beforehand, which made the UN very, very hesitant to send in um, military forces into war zones. But that completely allowed this thing to escalate to the point that it did. After a lot of the killing, the Hutus fleed to Burundi, um, to the west of Rwanda, and then they were treated as refugees even though they were the people that actually like did the killings. Um, and there's just a lot of lot of shit going on with like France sending the, the, the oppressive powers weapons and it's just an absolute shit show. <laughs> and I'd like to think that we would have learned from it, uh, but as Gorovich said, we thought you know, the establishment of the UN after World War II was to prevent something like this happening again. There was so much in this that was absolutely damning. As a book though, I found the structure um, quite good, difficult. Um, like it was really hard to do justice to the, the personal horror of the killing and explain all the pre-context and explain all the post-context. Um, and I just felt like it didn't, it, it didn't structure it in a way that had the most impact it just felt like it was like a, you're just being shot facts um the the personal interviews were, were really good but i don't know philip gorovich also he goes into the narrative a bit and it just i kind of came out of it being like Wah, information ah but like without a cohesive anything <laughs> but if you'd like to know a bit more about world history um or the way in which geopolitical forces can enable genocide this one's for you. Next book I read was Jonathan Livingston Seagull by Richard Bach. Um, I was <laughs> having a chat with some work colleagues and the CEO of my company like basically insisted that I read this book and bought me a copy of it. It came out in 1970 and it is a pseudo philosophical messiah fable. So it's very much along the lines of The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho where you kind of read it in college and think it's like the most incredible, like deep philosophical, inspirational book you've ever read. And then you pick it up a few years later and you're like, wow, that was shallow. What did I get from that? And I feel like I'm now at the point in life, <laughs> halfway between when you would read this in college and be like, wow, that's amazing. And in your mid forties reading it again, wanting that ins <laughs> inspiration you got in college and then being like, this is shit. Um, so I kind of knew coming into it that I could take it whatever which way. And I decided to divest myself of all of those um, 
that kind of context of like, let it change your life. Um, and just read it as a story. And I read it as a story and I found it absolutely delightful. So it's a little book about a non-conformist seagull um, who wants to perfect the art of flying and is really annoyed that all of the other seagulls don't seem to care about how fast they can fly. Uh, so he flies super, super fast and then he goes into like another dimension with other seagulls that want to fly really fast. Um, and then he comes back to teach the seagulls how to fly faster, basically. Um, it's so much sweeter than that. It's just very innocent and and wonderful. And I love all of the, the imagery of flight and the majesty of birds is just really nice. And I'm happy with having enjoyed it on that level of like, I'm glad that Jonathan Livingston Seagull like found his thing and was able to spread it. And that's really nice. Do I feel particularly inspired? No. Do I expect other books to make me particularly inspired? No, I just expect them to be enjoyable reading experiences. And that's what Jonathan Livingston Seagull was to me. Cutscene. <laughs> the next book I have to talk to you about is Thank You Jeeves by P.G. Worcester. Um, this was given to me by my boyfriend for Christmas because he was like, you said recently that you want to have more light stuff to read and I don't think you've ever read any of his work for. And I was like, you are so correct. Um, and I found out last week that actually in December, um, Audible released a collection of Jeeves and Worcester um, stories, like five books worth, um, narrated by Stephen Fry. So I, for the last two weeks, which will come up in my January reviews video, um, have been listening to those things. And it's especially the, the introduction by Stephen Fry gave me a lot more context on like the world that Woodhouse created. It's a very eternally sunshine, whimsical, place uh, where it's sort of the 20s, 30s, but there's no mention of war. And, um, you know, he just has a load of money and like nothing's really a problem. He doesn't have to work. Um, and it's all just just a big party. And Stephen Fry was saying that even in the 40s, uh, this came out in 1934, even in the 40s, it was considered like quaint, the, the world that Woodhouse created. And I think now looking back on it, it's kind of, you can read it and think that it's realistic like it was a realistic depiction of that time and it just wasn't ever meant to be it was meant to be like a, a, a nice stage set for Woodhouse to set these comedic stories so this story thank you Jeeves is the first full-length Jeeves novel and it follows uh Bertram Worcester and Jeeves as they go down to Worcester's mates Chuffy's uh castle down near Western Supermare or something um, and there's lots of shenanigans. There's always, it's always just shenanigans and Jeeves solves it. And it is just delightful. The prose is so comical and it is just warm and light and it is a very nice read. The trouble with this one though, um, I've spoken on this channel before about my difficulty with um, historical literature and sort of, I can reframe some things in the present and they're fine. Um, like I'm, I'm okay with this being quite a patriarchal world. Like that's fine with me. Um, but like a large portion of the plot of this relies on blackface. Um, and that's just one of those things that I've so, it's so embedded in my brain as being unacceptable. It was very hard to let that, <laughs> let that be an okay thing to be a plot point um, or a plot device, I suppose. Uh, but I still enjoyed it a lot and that's is what I'm going to say about this. <laughs> Next book I have to talk about is Some 40 Tales from the Afterlife by David Eagleman. This came out in 2009 um, and it's just 40 short stories, like two, three pages about different ideas of what could happen in the afterlife. It's a very imaginative little book. Um, it doesn't take any any like conceptions we currently have about what the afterlife is for granted. It goes off in so many different directions, um, some more kind of spiritual and religion, um, some more kind of physics and biology. And a lot of them are just sort of, just very novel ideas, the kind of thing that you read and you're like, well, the clever man came up with this. They didn't actually make me really think about the afterlife at all. Like it didn't make me think about death or what, what is going to happen to me at the end because I mean I'm a I'm a strong atheist I think nothing happens um but it really it did enliven in me how 
wonderfully inventive humankind is. <laughs> so many of these are just very, very witty, and very, very imaginative, and it's fun to read it just for a sort of breadth exercise. Like, um, it's something I do so much at work, and I think we probably all do it in our lives, but maybe don't think about the practice of having um, having like a problem to solve and really, really widening out to every single possibility by um, analyzing each of the assumptions we've made that we that constrain us. And the, the more you um, analyze and debunk those constraints, the wider the, the solution can get. Um, and that's that kind of breadth exercise is what leads to something as, as weird as this. I say that none of them really struck me about thinking about the afterlife, but there was one um, which I, I just kind of sat with. Um, it's called Conversation. Um, and I was like, wow, that's a weird idea of how the world works. And it's about how um, a single quark has composed the entire universe by jumping through space time and becoming every atom of everything we see. Um, and what a, what a bonkers idea. <laughs> but I was sitting there and I was like, oh yes, it's composing everything about me and my thoughts are being composed by this one thing that knows everything and is constructing this whole world like piece by piece. And in the story, it's about how this quark is getting bored, slows down and therefore doesn't draw the bits of the universe that are, aren't being observed and eventually is going to slow down to the point that we just become like ribbons that you can see through because he hasn't, he, I don't know why I gendered him. Um, it's definitely an it. Damn it, Charlotte. It gets tired out and slowly draws less of the universe. Um, but there's still, a, there's still a kind of assumption in that story that we're working linearly, which is uh, linearly through time. Like he can jump through space time, but he's still, it's like over time we're decaying rather than it being like a finite. Anyway, we're getting into the details. There was also a really good story about how like at the end of the world, the world goes back in reverse. It was the very last one. Um, and it talks about how you're, you're, you're born as you're pulled out of the ground. Marriages re-ride rocky roads and eventually end in erotic dating. <laughs> On their last day, howling because it's the end of their lives, babies climb back into the wombs of their mothers who eventually shrink and climb back into the wombs of their mothers and so on like a concentric Russian dolls. And it's just so funny to, just and it, it, so much of this is just a weird, interesting thought exercise. It just makes you feel a lot more expansive in what your ideas could be. So as I said, couldn't really care for the afterlife sort of context of it, um, but I did think it was a brilliant little book. Final thing I have to talk about is that I finished the second and third um, audiobooks of the Stormlight Archive. So that's Words of Radiance and Oathbringer. And um, I like them, but I just, I'm liking it less. This is one of my issues with big fantasy is that over time, because it has to get more fantastical, it gets more fantastical in a way that it's like, how is the world created? Who is God? And I much prefer the fantasy of like normal-ish people living in a slightly weird world, which is what the first book the Way of Kings absolutely nailed. Um, and I'm very attached to the characters in this universe, um, but I just kind of, I just really lost touch towards the end with all the, the weird stuff going on. And you know, when you're, when you're listening to an audiobook and it's very action heavy, especially towards the end, and you lose a bit of the thread of what's going on. And then in the end, you're like, well, I don't even know what, what I'm supposed to be looking out for now. Um, so I'm not sure I even could read the next book if I wanted to. So the fourth in the series of, of Plan 10 um, came out last month. Um, I don't know, I don't know whether to pursue it. I might switch over and read the Mistborn trilogy instead. Um, if you have any thoughts or feelings about um, Brandon Sanderson's works, let me know. But also if you have any recommendations of the sort of fantasy I described I liked, which is just a slightly weird world, but with like a magic system but normalish people living in it where it never even touches the concept of divinity that would be fantastic <laughs> thank you for watching this video i picked up the dog to say goodbye with me he's unhappy because he was asleep uh but thank you so much for watching char reads um i will see you in about a week's time hopefully for my january reviews in the comments i would love to hear the top two books you read last year. It's something I've been asking like everyone I know 
two books from last year that blew you away and why, because uh, I could do with some recommendations for the year. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye! Bye! <laughs>